I'm pleased to uh, introduce to you our lecturer today. Uh, he is the director of the Institute for Renaissance and Reformation Biblical Studies of Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, he comes to us uh, today uh, with actually two distinct seminars. Uh, Dr. Letus is the past president of the University of Edinburgh Theological so Society. He is currently a member of the Society of Biblical Literature, where he has served on the steering committee for the history of interpretation section. He's a member of the American Academy of Religion, where he's currently part of the seminar Historical Consciousness and its Impact on Christian Churches, a member of the American Society of Church History. He has a PhD from the University of Edinburgh in Ecclesiastical History and honors MTS from Emory University in American Church History. He has completed graduate studies at Westminster Seminary, Philadelphia, St. Charles Bormio Seminary in Philadelphia, Concordia Theological Seminary in Fort Wayne, Indiana. He also holds a BA degree in Biblical Studies and History from Evangel College with additional undergraduate studies completed at Southwest Missouri State University. He has authored and edited several books, including the Majority Text, Essays and Reviews in the Continuing Debate in its second edition, the Ecclesiastical Text, Text Criticism, Biblical Authority in the Popular Mind, second edition. Ted has also had an active lecturing schedule. Uh, a very brief summary of those includes lecturing before the Evangelical Theological Society, presenting his paper, B.B. Warfield's Common Sense Philosophy in New Testament Criticism. Also lecturing before the Scottish University's Ecclesiastical History Conference, the Theological University in Campen, and to the English Department and Medieval Studies Department at Trinity College, Dublin and also, and finally, to the annual International Meeting of Society of Biblical Literature in Berlin, Germany last year. It is my distinct privilege, indeed, to present to you Dr. Theodor Letus. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I love the informality of this. This is like uh, one big seminar, and uh, I hope uh, it'll take on the feel of a seminar. A seminar, of, of course, is where not only the moderator has input, but everyone around the table is expected to have input. So uh, at the end of the talk, I hope that uh, there'll be some uh, searching and thoughtful questions. Uh, let me just say that uh, one of the things that grips me about our God and his holy book is that he is forever displaying himself as a lover of irony. The fact that our, our Lord, uh, second person, of the Trinity was born in a stable is probably one of the most uh, blatant examples of, of God's use of irony. He loves to get our attention by irony. And uh, we're experiencing a wonderful irony by gathering here today because it was on the campus of Calvin Theological Seminary that the New International Version was hatched as a notion many, many years ago, which really took us into a whole new era of uh, witnessing the corporate profit-making publishing world dictating to the church what the configuration of her text and canonical boundaries would be. And that was a very dark development of which we're still reaping bitter, bitter fruit. But here we are to sort of set the record straight a little bit in the very site where that idea was launched. The first thing that I want to say before I begin talking about Bergon is something that I think is extraordinarily vital when engaging these subjects. We had dinner last night and had an extensive conversation about um, certain challenging and, and puzzling and, and uh, uh, troubling aspects to trying to articulate a doctrine of preservation. And uh, we may have been as long as an hour in the conversation before uh, one of the gentlemen I was speaking with uh, realized that I wasn't at all advocating what he thought I was advocating. And uh, uh, a, a dawn of light appeared, and uh, we were on a, a much more amicable basis from that point on. But you know, in the early church, uh, one of the techniques that the Roman Empire used to defame Christianity was to take their teachings and, and caricature them so that uh, they would appear 
to, in a very unfavorable light. For example, because um, Christians partook uh, of, of uh, communion and, and took the bread and the wine, commemorating the body and blood of Christ, the Romans spread the, uh, the idea that, that Christians were cannibals. Because Christians had love for one another, the Romans spread the rumor that they were licentious and libertine in their sexual practices. Because the Christians had no image of their God, the Romans spread the error that they were atheists. Now you can see how three very honorable and fundamental principles in the Christian faith were taken and turned into monstrous ideas and were propagated. And is it any wonder it took 300 years for the Romans to finally give up trying to trample them into the ground and, and suddenly and finally succumb to the sheer power of the Christian faith as the empire was reoriented and converted to Christianity, so to speak. Well, I'm afraid we suffer from the same kind of bad press with this issue because those who are the most public and those who speak in the loudest terms about doctrines such as inspiration and preservation have unfortunately not done a very good job in representing those doctrines as they have been expressed by better minds than themselves, such as Bergen and Hills. And when Russ um, presented the notion to me of the possibility of doing this conference, I realized that what has to be done foremost is a, a massive job of damage control and uh, uh, setting the record straight and rescuing Bergen and Hills from the clutches of various communities who unfortunately have not read them carefully and if they have, have not chosen to represent them accurately. And for that reason, uh, I see it as one of the primary purposes of our gathering here today um, being my dispelling a lot of misconceptions that have surrounded the names of Bergen and Hills. Finally, on that note, I have to stress to you that I also made a deliberate attempt in our program brochure that was sent out to most of you to underscore the fact that I am of the Lutheran faith, of the very most conservative branch, confessional Lutheranism. Bergen was a high church Anglican who believed in baptismal regeneration and had no liking for separatists from the Church of England. Now these features uh, are probably very much underplayed by the most vocal advocates of Bergen, and uh, they do that uh, both uh, uh, damaging his reputation and damaging the truth because uh, uh, there's actually a society that has formed of which I was a founding board member and was asked to uh, um, tender my resignation because I would not agree to abandon my church membership and become a separatist. Uh, because the founder of the so-called Dean Bergan Society demanded that all members be of exactly the same ecclesiastical orientation as himself, even though ironically that would mean that Bergan himself could not be a member of a society that had taken his name. Now you can see how that discredits our our position from the very beginning, out of the starting gate. Uh, people t uh, become cognizant of that and they, they realize that uh, whoever's advocating this position uh, is not terribly informed. And, uh, and finally, Edward Hills himself uh, was a Pado baptist five-point Calvinist. Perhaps I've not described anyone around this table or in this room today with those designations. But the truth is, these are the men that God chose to use to be the champions of the subject of textual criticism and explain to you and I how our doctrine of verbal inspiration can be understood in the face of an avalanche of challenging data and information from the variations that are found in the textual evidence and the textual manuscripts. It is these men who spent their lives mastering the evidence and we owe it to them to read them in their own light, in their own context, and take them at their own words as to the evidence that they discovered, how they interpreted it, and how they presented their evidence before the academic world and the church world, rather than take their ideas, twist them, distort them, and put them in a foreign context uh, 
so that somehow their teachings can affirm a distinctive that is more important to us than even the doctrine of preservation that they were busy attempting to defend. Now, I, I hope I'm not speaking in a too opaque a manner. I hope you grasp my meaning that these men need to be understood as they understood themselves rather than as some contemporary advocate would twist their ideas and, and put them through a sieve, making them sound like uh, something they weren't. For example, an early reprint of Bergon's uh, works uh, appeared some 20 years ago, and on the cover it referred to Bergon as a fundamentalist. There was no such category as fundamentalism in the late Victorian era. Fundamentalism was a, an early 20th century American phenomenon. To put the tag of fundamentalist on Bergon is a great distortion. But uh, this, this is another example of the things that came out of the so-called Dean Bergon Society and, and still emerges from there. Well, enough of that. It, it, it was a, that's not uh, the positive thing that I want to discuss or the positive side of the issue. But unfortunately, it, it's an issue that had to be addressed. Now, let's move on to Bergon. Who was he? He was the son of a very successful merchant. His mother uh, was from Smyrna, or at least his father and his mother lived in Smyrna for a, a good long time. There's a little fuzziness there, but uh, it does seem as though there is some lineage on his mother's side to ethnic groups that we know of as, uh, as Greek. So there is some Greek blood in Bergen. We're not quite sure to what extent or at what part of his maternal family uh, it's derived from, but he was both Greek, Austrian, and English in his um, ethnic background. He, uh, he was a very uh, uh, prodigi prodigious student as a young man, but uh, he only had an opportunity at the age of 16 to spend one year at uh, the University of London before his father enlisted him uh, to work in his business his mercantile business. But some uh, many years later, he matriculated at Oxford as a, an older student at 28 years old. And he studied classics, he studied history, and he studied theology. He earned his BA at Oxford at Oriel College. He earned his MA, and then he earned his BD and spent many, many years at Oxford and eventually was given the post of, Machen, uh, of uh, Gresham professor of theology and, and, and taught at Oriel College for many years. It was during his tenure at Oxford that two great movements emerged within the Church of England. One was the Oxford movement that was advocating a push towards Rome, if not indeed a reuniting with Rome. And in fact, uh, <clears throat> uh, one of Bergon's predecessors at, at St. Mary's, church in the university there where he preached was John Henry Newman, who in fact was the leader of the Oxford movement, who did in fact go back to the Church of England. And it was that very pulpit that Bergon himself filled after Newman had aligned himself with the Church of Rome. Uh, the other movement that was uh, emerging on English soil was neology, or the new German rationalism, as it was filtering its way into the academic um, colleges uh, within the, the Church of England. And um, one of the most celebrated published works promoting the new uh, criticism, the historical criticism coming out of Germany, was a book titled Essays and Reviews. Thank you. And uh, in the book Essays and Re Reviews, by the way, my first book, uh, borrowed in its subtitle, the title from that book. Um, my book, the majority text, uh, Essays and Reviews in the Continuing Debate, uh, was taken from the title of this very celebrated book advocating um, historical criticism in, in a very um, uh, unvarnished way. This book, Essays and Reviews, uh, became the discussion piece for many, many, many years in Great Britain and really was uh, signaled a turning point uh, 
in the Church of England turning from her 17th century Orthodox confessional moorings to Germany and the critical approach to studying the text of Scripture that was coming out of there. And <clears throat> in fact, it was this book that prompted Burgon to go into St. Mary's and mount the pul pulpit and deliver uh, sequentially seven different sermons in response to this book, Essays and Reviews. And in these sermons, <clears throat> what he defended was the inspiration of Scripture because he realized that this attack coming from Germany was nothing less than a frontal assault against the doctrine of verbal inspiration. And to give you an idea of how he attacked Essays and Reviews, this is the paragraph that got him in the most trouble. He said, <clears throat> either the whole Bible is inspired, the words as well as the sentences, the syllables as well as the words, the letters as well as the syllables, every jot and every tittle of it, or the whole of it must be abandoned since no part of it can be certainly depended upon as an infallible guide. Now, most of us probably would say, well, what is so radical about that? Well, and in fact, uh, two or three generations prior to Burgon, that was the standard orthodoxy within the Church of England. It was no longer the standard orthodoxy by the time he reasserted these words. And so they were very provocative to the younger generation of divinity students who were at Oxford at this time. And it was an occasion for absolute and continuous ridicule. Burgon was held up as a buffoon. Did he really say that? Every syllable? Every jot and tittle? He's lost all credibility. That was in fact, I will say it again, the absolute gold standard of orthodoxy within the Church of England two or three generations prior to Burgon, but it was quickly slipping away. And why was it slipping away? It was slipping away because textual critics had found so much textual variation in the older manuscripts that it, everyone had a sense that this doctrine was now passe and we must busy ourselves reconstructing some kind of a new doctrine that would allow us to see the Bible as somehow still authoritative while jettisoning this doctrine of verbal inspiration. Well, having made this claim publicly in, in a very uh, almost combative way, now Burgon had to answer this question. How do you align your doctrine of verbal inspiration with all the textual variation that is found in the manuscript witnesses? So as soon as this was thrown up to him, he immediate, immediately busied himself trying to underscore and reinforce what he had affirmed dogmatically. Now, did he do it by um, just affirming and dogmatically asserting, uh, certain in a dogmatic fashion, uh, how we must accept this in an unthinking or anti-intellectual fashion? No, that was not the caliber of the man. And you can believe that was not the caliber of the man because what he did was he assigned to himself the task of being the greatest authority in textual criticism in all of Great Britain, which he in fact attained. He spent the rest of his life traveling all through Europe, collating every extant manuscript of the Greek New Testament he could find, as well as the lectionaries, and as well as the patristic citations found in the works of the anti-Nicene, Nicene, and post-Nicene fathers. So much so that, as I said last night, uh, or earlier this week, I should say, at the very dawning of the first revision committee attempting to update the authorized version in, um, in the 1870s, Burgon published, um, right on the heels of their convening, what was the most exhaustive monograph putting before the learned world every shred of evidence there was
in the discussion treating the last 12 verses of Mark. And in the process of, uh, process of compiling that evidence, he, unlike Westcott and Hort, actually collated Codex Vaticanus and Codex Sinaiticus, and thereby discovered the gap at the end of Mark in both of those manuscripts, where the scribes had been instructed to deliberately leave out the long ending last 12 verses, as witnessed by the gap, which all of you can see on the two photographs on the first panel of my display board there. And anyone whose eyes fall on that leaf can see what's going on. Weskin and Hort hadn't bothered to do that. And so posited that the long ending of Mark was an addendum added well after the fact and was therefore uh, illegitimate, inauthentic, and should be taken out of the text of Scripture. Because Bergen had actually looked at those manuscripts, he discovered the reason why they were missing and told the world in his treatise. But by the time he published his defense of the last 12 verses of Mark, there was only probably a handful of people in all of Great Britain who knew the evidence the way he did. Now, how are you able to communicate the technicalities of a discipline like text criticism when there isn't anyone who can appreciate your evidence? It's like going into a, a court of law and, and having a high school student uh, sit in the judge's seat and pass judgment on the evidence you're presenting in defense of your case. They're incompetent. They're incapable of appreciating your argumentation. And that's what Bergon had to deal with. The only other man who was his equal, Frederick Henry Ambrose Scribner, was actually on the revision committee. And Bergon was feeding him his data. And every time they got around a table very similar to this, and began to make a judgment as to whether the angel who troubled the water in John's gospel should be left in or out, since it was missing from the oldest witnesses, Hort would stand up and present his case, why we must doggedly follow the oldest evidence. Scribner would stand up and reply, many times using evidence that had been given to him by Bergon, and present the case in favor of the account of the woman, of the angel troubling the water in John's gospel. And, uh, however, Scribner was outvoted because it was Westcott and Hort against him. Bergon, you see, was not invited to be on that panel, to be on that committee, uh, because everyone knew where he stood. And he was not a get-along kind of fella. <laughs> but generally, uh, Scribner had the better evidence, had the better arguments, but because he, was around, he sat around a table with men who were incompetent, they couldn't appreciate what he was saying, and Hort was a botanist, he was a scientist, as well as a philologist, and a pretend text critic. And his theory was so compelling, and his rhetorical presentation of it was so compelling, that everyone thought that Hort represented the future, and Scrivener represented the past. And so Hort won the day. And, of course, this frustrated Bergon no end. So when the Revised Version came out and gone was the, were the last 12 verses, gone was the angel troubling the water, gone was uh, 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 many, many, many other passages. I won't belabor them now. Uh, he decided to, if he couldn't prevent the decimation of the Bible at the beginning of the committee's activity, he thought that perhaps he could at least persuade the, mind, the better minds within the Church of England to now reject it once it appeared. So he, he shot off three powerful, extraordinarily informed essays to um, uh, the Quarterly Review Journal, one treating the changes in the Revised Version and the lack of evidence for their having taken place, the text underlying the Revised Version and why it was uh, not uh, sufficiently grounded on all the evidence, and finally the theory of Hort that was weaved to produce the text that resulted in the revised version. So it was a three-tiered attack. He decimated Hort, um, and anybody who reads what became the monograph, The Revision Revised, his three essays in their published form as a book, will know that he decimated Hort. And uh, as a result, he spawned a new generation of critics who came out from under the spell of Hort. And, and uh, for example, Professor Salmon from Dublin wrote a wonderful book uh, affirming that Bergam was right. Uh, 
and Hort was wrong. Um, and there were several other books that came out. And, and, uh, and finally, uh, one of Hort's um, protégés from America, a gentleman by the name of Herman C. Hoskier, decided that nobody was listening to Bergon and that he would take the evidence and shove it in the face, if, it, if you will, of those who had been under the spell of Hort. So he decided to do what Bergon did in a tentative fashion. He went back to Codex Vaticanus and Sinaiticus and did an absolutely exhaustive collation of both manuscripts and demonstrated to the world that they conflicted with one another in over 5,000 places in the Gospels alone. And when his monograph, Codex B and its allies, appeared a massive two-volume piece full of nothing but collations, collations, page after page after page of Greek collations. Uh, the better text critics, the better minds realized that Hoskier had killed Hort. That in the Gospels alone, 5,000 times, either Vaticanus or Sinaiticus were lying. They couldn't both be right. And... Uh, Although in the annals of the history of text criticism, if you read Bruce Metzger, if you read Kurt Allen, or any survey of the history of text criticism, you will not see it admitted. But I can tell you for a fact, if you'd corner them and ask them, was Hoskier's work on Kodak's B and its allies the reason that the Horsian theory finally fell to the ground? They will tell you re re uh, grudgingly, yes, because the data was overwhelming. A new theory had to emerge. And the new theory is the theory that dominates at this very moment in time. It's called the eclectic approach to constructing the New Testament text. And, and, and what does that mean in contrast to the Horsian theory? Hort said where these two manuscripts agree, you have the autographa. But since Hosker had demonstrated that they disagree almost as much as they agree, uh, we still don't have the best form of the earliest form of the text. So now what scholars have to do is they have to pick and choose where they think the correct reading is. Sometimes they choose Vaticanus. Sometimes they choose Sinaiticus. Sometimes they choose Codex D. Sometimes they use, choose from the pre-Caesarean text. Sometimes they choose from the Caesarean text. Sometimes <clears throat> they choose from the Old Latin. Sometimes they choose from the Harclean Syriac. Sometimes they choose from the Coptic. And sometimes they just guess. They reject all the evidence. And the end result is a purely eclectic text that if you ask them, can you show us one manuscript from antiquity that mirrors your theoretically reconstructed eclectic text the blood will rush to their face, and they will tell you, well, there isn't one, because we created our text ad hoc. It is an eclectic text, but we believe it is the best text you will ever find. But it doesn't match any manuscript in antiquity. It is obviously something that's been weaved through the ingenuity of, of, of human consciousness. It is not something that reflects an established, um, written and transmitted form of the text. In contrast, Erasmus, when he <clears throat> published the first edition of the uh, Textus Recaptus, what he used for his printer's copy was a late medieval manuscript that had been written pr probably in a Greek Orthodox scriptorium by a Greek Orthodox monk, he took that manuscript with some notations in the margins from other manuscripts he had looked at and handed it to Frobin. Frobin, when he typeset his, the first edition of the TR, merely copied in an uncreative way the consensus that had come down through nearly 1,500 years of manuscript transmission. So it wasn't Erasmus making up what he thought the text was, it was him uncreatively replicating a consensus that the church had handed to him. And you see how very different the two methods were. One bowed to the providence of God, to the
faithful transmission of the text by Orthodox believers, the other community concluded that the Orthodox believers had corrupted that text, and we have to go behind it and go on a quest for the historical text, a quest that never reaches the end of the horizon. It just goes on and on and on. So, uh, Burgon was vindicated, and Hoskier is the man who vindicated him. And uh, I, I, I want to read to you um, a passage written by Burgon in a letter towards the end of his life to give you an idea of uh, the character of the man. And this he wrote to one of his patrons, uh, one of the aristocracy in the, in the late Victorian era. He says, My dear friend, I hasten to reply to your kind letter. Ever since 1831, the text of the New Testament has been like a storm-tossed barge, drifting <clears throat> along without a captain, chart, or compass. At the end of 50 years, things reached their climax, uh, that is, in 1881, when the maximum of damage was sustained. Dr. Scribner, the best critic living, says of the latest editors of the Greek text, and he uses a, a Latin term there, is that they have utterly failed. It was a splendid failure. Ever since 1866 or 7, I had had my eye fastened on this danger. And why? Because he told the whole world the Bible was verbally inspired, and now he had to demonstrate how that stands up against the challenges of text criticism. He was a man of integrity. <coughs> He knew he was obliged to address that issue. It was a conversation with yourself by lamplight in Christ Church, Quadrangle, I suppose in about 1871 or two, that finally determined me to make it the business of my life, to try to secure the deposit, to recall men to their senses, to vindicate the truth of Scripture, and to establish it on a scientific basis. And by that he means by actually examining all the evidence. That's what he meant by scientific basis. It was a gigantic undertaking, but I was confident of success, full of hope, and full of spirits. I cannot say how hard I worked besides visiting the principal libraries of Europe in order to familiarize myself with manuscripts, I collated the most of them for myself. I formed a library of fathers and began to index them. At the end of 1875, the deanery was offered me, and I gratefully accepted it, the deanery at Chichester in the southern part of England, chiefly in order to be able to devote myself without distraction to my self-imposed task. I toiled on <clears throat> unremittingly in spite of every discouragement and with such, such success that in the autumn of 1881, I was able to pour such a broad side into the so-called revised Greek text, which had appeared in the spring of the same year, that it was declared on all hands to be no longer seaworthy. It was a tremendous effort, but I repeated the broadside in January and again in April. These three articles in the quarterly review I greatly enlarged and republished in 1883. I dedicated the revised version to yourself. I have been at work ever since. The danger has not been overcome. It has only been checked and retarded, but it will reappear inevitably. I have nothing on my side, scarcely, but the truth. Crippled as I was uh, last year, I resolved to strengthen my defenses, to gather allies, and to make one more systematic advance against, against the enemy. So I've had my indexes of the fathers increased, have carried down my inquiries to the uh, eighth and ninth century, and in less than two months from this date, 
shall have my ponderous tomes back from all my uh, uh, assistants, and shall be, uh, and I can't read uh, the line there, I'm afraid the copy I'm working from is, is, is not as clear as it might be. He goes on to say, you will understand that in brief, my object is to vindicate the traditional text of the New Testament against all its past and present assailants, and to establish it on such a basis of security that it may be incapable of being effectually disturbed anymore. I propose to myself to lay down logical principles and to demonstrate that men have been going wrong for the last 50 years. To explain how this has come to pass in every instance <clears throat> and to go them to admit their error. At least I will convince every fair person that the truth is what it, I say it is, that in, in, in nine cases out of ten the commonly received text is the true one. What you are bent on doing for your imperial interest of Great Britain, I am seeking to do for the word of God. A single text has before me now occupied me all day long for many weeks. And he's dealing with 1 Timothy 3.16. And he says, it has taxed my energy for six months. He says, in the meantime, as I venture to tell you, the struggle I have had to make against insufficiency of income, which has long been embarrassing me, is at last entirely disheartening, or rather paralyzing me. My health seems at last to be giving way. I can bear it no longer. The secret of my success hitherto has been my unbroken sleep. I no longer sleep soundly. I wake early and distress myself with the, loomy, the, the gloomy forecast. Anxieties preying upon me night and morning effectually hinder my work and will end by embittering hopelessly my life and ruin the, ruining the prospects of those whom God has given me. I fear I have wearied you, but I have tried to answer your question as succinctly as I can without being unintelligible. Ever yours affectionately and gratefully, J.W. Bergon. So you can see there that he, uh, he quite literally spent every, and he was an unmarried man, so he had no encumbrances from family obligations or responsibilities. He spent the last of his days toiling, trying to compile the patristic citations from the anti-Nicene, Nicene, and post-Nicene fathers right down to the ninth century to show that the text they used always and ever was, in fact, the ecclesiastical text, the traditional text, the Byzantine text, until finally, uh, his lack of sufficient income to support him while he was doing this left him uh, in, in a state of utter despair and uh, he couldn't carry on. His anxiety began to overwhelm him and he died very shortly after that. Well, as we talk about Edward Hills a little later, we'll find out that all the effort he put into this issue also resulted in his being marginalized. Uh, possibly the only man that I've ever heard of who had a classics degree from Yale and a doctorate from Harvard in text criticism, who was uh, uh, unable to gain a, a sufficient academic post so that his work could be surveyed and, and, and received by other academics. Instead, he was pushed to the margins in exactly the way that Bergon was. Um, but I'm thankful that there are such men who are possessed with, with such uh, undaunting motivation and, and, and filled with the passion to be utterly spent for the service of the Church of Jesus Christ. But because of his labors, he inspired other men, like Hoskier and Edward Hills, who we'll talk about a little later this morning. And it's, it's that uh, uh, unambiguous and unequivocal dedication to the cause that, that underscores the fact that it was his reverence for the authority of Scripture that motivated his carefulness as a scholar. And that those who speak sometimes in the shrillest tones attempting to defend Scripture without backing it up with the hard industry that it requires and who traffic only in inflammatory and, and, and bombast rhetoric uh, 
are not following in the tradition of Bergon. We have to quietly do our homework and prove that we know what we're talking about before we enter this forum, otherwise we discredit this man's name and this man's work. And let me just end there and, and open things up now for discussion. I want to hear what you think about Bergon and if you have any questions about him or about this period of church history in England and, or anything related to anything we've spoken about thus far. All right, I've been asked to repeat all questions from uh, our gathering for the recording purposes, and I'll summarize your question, and it's a, it's a very common one, but that's because it's a very important one. The question was, um, I've been pointing out the divergences that exist in what the status quo refers to as the most ancient manuscripts, or the oldest evidence, and is it not true that the various editions of the TR have a similar kind of divergency amongst them, amongst their witnesses? And of course, the answer to that is yes. Uh, and uh, Bergen was aware of that, as was Hills. And anybody who gets close to the phenomena of, of, of uh, textual evidence, the first thing that leaps all over them is the fact that there is no neat and tidy, seamless uniformity. Because we're dealing with sources that were written by human beings who are very, very subject to error. In fact, it's very ironic that when you go to the Oxford English Dictionary and look up the word inerrancy, you find out that it never came into theological use until the 19th century. And the first time it's used, because it was an astronomical term, and it was always used in reference to the, to the route that heavenly bodies take in, in their inerrant uh, order. It was never a theological term. And the first time it was used outside of astronomy, it was used in reference to book production. And uh, ironically, it was used to say that it's impossible to produce an inerrant published book. <laughs> I find that ironic because... Warfieldians in, in the early 20th century started to use the word in reference to scripture, and, and it's a totally and utterly inappropriate word. <clears throat> so to get back to your question, uh, yes, there are differences because the manuscripts are written by hand, and there are no two manuscripts that you can overlay them and find out that they're exactly the same as though they were photocopied on a Xerox machine, because there were no Xerox machines. Everything was hand done. So there are divergencies in all manuscripts of all text types. And all published edi editions differ from one another slightly. The Nesso Island text is in its 27th edition. Because the evidence either keeps emerging or keeps being reconfigured. So that its priorities uh, keep being altered as new studies and new monographs and new journal essays are published. And, and uh, they, scholars keep changing their minds. Uh, and therefore, and this brings me to a discussion we had last night, and I, this tends to be very helpful. Therefore, we have to discuss this issue at a two-tiered level, in a two-tiered way. The top tier is the macro level. The bottom tier is the micro level. At the macro level, Bergon argued, as did many of his predecessors and many who followed after him, that at the macro level, that form of the text that came down in the actual usage of the church accurately and comprehensively mirrors the consensus of the early church on what was written about Jesus in terms of who he was, what he did, and what he said that that account is comprehensively accurate, faithful, and trustworthy. Whereas those forms of the Greek New Testament that did not make it into the mainstream of transmission and therefore were never used as scripture in the worshiping community were pushed to the side. And when they're examined and their character and nature are compared to that form of the text I call the ecclesiastical text, the differences are dramatic and profound at the macro level. And they tend in directions that suggest that the Orthodox Jesus that we all know might have been very, very, very different if we follow that earlier evidence that connects us organically to other evidence 
forms uh, of belief about who Jesus was. For example, Marcion uh, was around believing communities initially, but then broke away and formed his own little sect, whereby he believed the Old Testament God was Gnostic-like, the Demiurge, who was an evil God. <clears throat> he was the Jewish God. And therefore, he cut out the entire Old Testament. <clears throat> and in the New Testament, he dismissed all the Gospels as being too Jewish, except for Luke. And he cut up Luke. And the passages of Jesus uh, in the garden, sweating great drops of blood, is missing in some texts. Scholars believe that Marcion may have well have been responsible for that because he also didn't believe that Christ was in a real body. He, he was an advocate of doceticism. He just appeared to be in a real body. So uh, sweating great drops of blood would seem to indicate he was a three-dimensional human being. Also, when he prayed from the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That's missing in some sources. They believe Marcion took it out because they didn't like Jesus' friendly disposition uh, forgiving the Jews for murdering him, when in fact it was the Romans, but uh, Marcion w would have omitted it for that reason. So when we go back to the oldest evidence, it seems to be evidence that's connected with this, these aberrant movements in the very early part of the church, before orthodoxy was completely and ultimately defined in the Nicene era, where the ecclesiastical text begins to dominate the manuscript transmission stream. So the character at the macro level the character differences between the pre-Nicene witnesses that Hort and our contemporary scholars want to go back to and the post-Nicene ecclesiastical text, the character is dramatically different. And Bergam was arguing at that level, as was Edward Hills. At the micro level, we all have problems. But in the received text tradition, the ecclesiastical text tradition, the micro differences and problems don't disturb or interrupt the full-bodied theology that the early church embraced and that we continue to embrace as orthodox believers. Whereas at the micro level, the alternate older witnesses from Egypt have many, 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 many problems. Um, because uh, E.C. Caldwell did a comprehensive collation of the three oldest papyri that we've ever found, Codex 66, Codex 45, and Codex 75. And he discovered that they were some of the sloppiest examples of transcription that have ever been found in the history of manuscript writing. But they're the oldest witnesses. So you see, the, the, the pre-Nicene Egyptian witnesses at the macro and the micro level have many more problems than we do. If you look at the scribal habits of the received text, and my good friend Maurice Robinson wrote an entire dissertation at South, uh, 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 Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary on this, dealing particularly with the book of the Apocalypse, he demonstrated that the scribal habits from the beginning of the Nicene era, when, when the ecclesiastical text dominates, were, it, it were, were extraordinarily careful. So there's, there's very, very little divergence within that textual tradition family. You get behind Nicaea, and there's all sloppiness and carelessness. Because many times, the reproductions of the text was hired out to professional scribes who were not necessarily part of the religious community for whom the text had meaning. So they might rush through their work to get done and get paid in a hurry. Uh, whereas a, a good example of what's going on today, where we hire the Bible out to Bible societies and profit-making publishers, who play with the text any way they want for commercial reasons, and they don't have the kind of high view of, <clears throat> of the text that believers might have. I think that's an apt parallel, as a matter of fact. But the scribal habits from the time of the establishment of the Nicene Orthodox era uh, are markedly different at the micro level from the quality of the text found in those alternate kinds of text that are derived from Egypt and elsewhere. I hope that's helpful. Paraphrasing, what role does the word inerrancy play uh, in relationship to this issue of text criticism and textual variation? If you will read Bergon's works, and he, uh, you know, as I said, he gave these seven sermons, which, uh, which were uh, a defense of verbal inspiration. And nowhere in his book will you ever find the word inerrancy, because it, it really didn't come into currency uh, 
until B.B. Warfield used it with a tremendous amount of force. And the reason he could use it, because it's totally inapt to apply to any manuscript. We've never found a manuscript that was without error. The reason he could use it is because he applied it only to the autographic form of the text, which is inscrutable. I mean, how would you disprove whether it was an error or not? It was a purely theoretical, apologetic move. But he, he did it in the short term to win an argument during his lifetime, which has caused uh, a, an entire uh, series of generations of folly that have followed in the wake as, as it became apparent that his stopgap move was a very uh, un unhelpful adjustment. Bergon referred to the text as infallible. That was the term, that was the religious term that was used from the Reformation right up until it was replaced with an errant, and always had reference to the existing extant text, and did not demand an impeccable, inerrant manuscript to have an absolutely infallible text in terms of what the text taught. Those two were not uh, uh, prerequisites for one another, as it became the case in Warfield. So Warfield gave us an entirely different paradigm, one that was very unhelpful, but one which allowed him to accommodate the Horsian approach to text criticism. I have three very, very important uh, chapters on this, tracing the history of it in my book, The Ecclesiastical Text, the first three chapters that I would encourage you to read, and it goes into a, a tremendous amount of detail on that very, very subject, a very important uh, theme, as a matter of fact. How does the care with which the Byzantine text was transcribed and copied compare to the care that the Masoretes exerted in reproducing the Hebrew text? very closely. And in fact, if you're looking for a parallel, the only place you can look for a parallel to the care that was exerted in the production of the Masoretic form of the Hebrew text is to go to the Byzantine text. In fact, Edward Hills in his excellent book, The King James Version Defended, draws that very same parallel and he points out that uh, before the Masoretes were even around, you know, they were a late development in the history of the transmission of the Hebrew Bible, but they they mirror the kind of care that was taking place before the Masoretes came on the scene. And we know that thanks to the Dead Sea Scrolls we, we learned about last night. There's a thousand year gap and the, the thousand year older Hebrew Bible reads just like the, the, the Bible, the Masoretes. Hills pointed out that the job of reproducing the Hebrew text was given to the Aaronic priesthood within the temple. And that it, they had professional scribes whose job it was merely to reproduce the Hebrew Bible. And uh, the Masoretes eventually brought it down to a, a really hard science uh, uh, in terms of counting every letter of every word of the Hebrew Bible in every book. And so when they transcribed it, if, if the tabulations didn't line up, they would have to start all over again. And, and that assured that there was a, a kind of near perfection in, in copying. Uh, and, and so when the Byzantine text was being copied, a parallel development took place in that uh, within the ecclesiastical scriptoria, men of faith were commissioned to do the transcribing. And so while they never developed the same kind of hard science as the Masoretes did, they exerted the same kind of care. But of course, you're dealing with the Greek language that um, uh, became rather complicated as the language evolved with, with accents and breathing marks and that sort of thing that the earliest form of the text didn't have. So you have that, that difficulty that accounts for uh, whatever confusion does emerge sometimes in the Byzantine text. The language itself was emerging and evolving much quicker than the Hebrew language did. Uh, but the parallel is apt because when we look at even in the Western church, the Lindisfarne Gospels are, are uh, um, the other forms of, of the medieval Latin Bible, uh, we can see what tremendous care, what a religious activity it was transcribing sacred text of the New Testament. And uh, so if you're looking for a parallel, the only place you will be able to find one to the Masoretes is the scribal tradition from within the Eastern Orthodox Church and even within the Western Church to a very, very large extent until the late medieval era when a lot of corruption began to take place in the West that we don't find in the East. It seems uh, fairly certain that within most conservative seminaries and Bible colleges 
and so forth, the knowledge that the dominant belief within the status quo uh, community of text critics is that there was a systematic orthodox corruption of the text that resulted in the ecclesiastical text, or what we know as the Byzantine text. Uh, uh, why is it that people don't know that, and what can, be, uh, what can be done to alert them to it? That was the question. Uh, if you know the name James White, some, he's something of a dilettante, a, a kind of a cult chaser who has a very popular radio program. He decided he was going to take on the defenders of the authorized version and treat them as another cult. Uh, and you know, put another notch on his gun, and he wrote a book called The King James Only Controversy. Um, and in that book, he made a very incautious and ill-informed, uh, unqualified, dogmatic statement, namely, that text criticism never affects doctrine. Uh, and so I replied to that in, in an appendix in my book, The Ecclesiastical Text, where I brought to his attention the fact that and the reader's attention, that he obviously was not very familiar with the literature of text criticism because a very important book had been out for several years by the time his book arrived by Bart Ehrman titled The Orthodox Corruption of Scripture, Early Christological Controversies uh, in the New Testament Text. And in that book, Bart Ehrman s says in, in very uh, great detail uh, all the theological points that are challenged by textual variation that are found in the Greek manuscripts. And, and how this systematic corruption of the text by the Orthodox is what actually produced what today we would call the fundamentals of the faith, that they were created by scribal editorial activity. And uh, I pointed out that how could White make such a statement in light of such a powerful, detailed study on the part of Bart Ehrman? Well, of course, he has since replied, he doesn't like to write much. He likes to do things orally in public debates and on the radio. He doesn't write much. So I think he went on the radio and said, oh, well, we don't need to listen to Bart Ehrman. He's a liberal. Well, in his book, James White endorses Bruce Metzger very highly, and Bruce Metzger endorses James White on the back of his book. Bart Ehrman got his PhD under the tutelage of Bruce Metzger. So if Bart Ehrman is liberal, I guess Bruce Metzger must be liberal, because he was Lu Metzger's student. And uh, Metzger himself admitted the text had been corrupted right in the title of his book. And he has a whole chapter where he talks about how the text was corrupted. Uh, what people don't like about Ehrman is that Ehrman made it his job to systematically supply all the examples that he believed illustrated this corruption. And it's so devastating to see it all compiled in one place, that uh, they can't answer it, so they dismiss him. Well, well, he's just liberal. But he's not liberal any more than any other text critic is liberal. What he is expressing is the status quo of the discipline. So I've done my part to try to let people know about this belief within text criticism, but uh, the evangelicals don't want to own up to it. You know, they want to be selective about what books they want to read and what books they don't want to read. They want to endorse text criticism, but they don't want to accept all the findings of it if it goes against their, their sacred cows. But uh, you can't have it that way. If you're going to give your stamp of approval to text criticism the way that James White does, you've got to embrace all of it. Because they're not making this stuff up. You know, you can't be selective as to what evidence you're going to accept and what you're not. You have to t take that road where it goes, to use my metaphor last night, or your inconsistency is going to be obvious to everyone. So we need to do more, and I'm going to continue doing my part. But uh, uh, if they just read the material that's out there, they'll see that that's... Now, you see, part of the problem was that Hort made an equally dogmatic claim in his introduction. He claimed that there had been no textual alteration that was motivated by theology. And he did that in order to put everybody at ease so that they would believe that there was nothing at stake if we throw out the last 12 verses of Mark. It doesn't change anything. If we change theos to has in 1 Timothy 3.16, it won't change anything. Uh, and of course, a lot of people believe that. Uh, somebody who was extraordinarily gu gullible on that point was Warfield. He believed that and repeated it to everybody within conservative Presbyterianism in the early part of the 19th, uh, uh, 20th century, I should say.
But we now know that that, 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 that was a, a fabrication. It, it was a, a being economical with the truth, shall we say? And, and um, thank goodness, I say, for Bart Ehrman's book, the truth is finally out now, and it's on the table. And we have to, uh, we have to take it seriously. We can't ignore that research the way White wants to do. In our contemporary situation, we know there are heretics who tamper with the Bible. For, for example, the Jehovah's Witnesses and other cults who alter the text. Uh, why, why is it we can't appreciate the fact that that must have also existed in the early church? And, uh, and who were these people, other people? Uh, the, the, the one problem with your question is that you're lumping them all in as church fathers. The church fathers were orthodox men. And the heretics, uh, we don't call them church fathers, we call them heretics. Uh, and in fact, the church, yeah, the church fathers who addressed heresy in the early church specifically more than other things, the ones who really, like Irenaeus and, and others who actually made it their task to answer heretics, they are called heresiologists. And <clears throat> Eusebius gives us a lot of information from them and about the heretics and who the heretics were and who the Orthodox fathers who addressed them were. But yeah, there's a whole array of them. Marcion is the most celebrated that we know altered the Greek New Testament in a systematic way. The Gnostics did. I, I gave you an example of Valentinus last night. Now, the early fathers all, there's nothing ambiguous about this, they all recognize Valentinus as a heretic, as one of the founding fathers of one of the schools of Gnosticism. Now, it would seem to me that if he presented an alternate reading to the Gospel of John, other than the one that's found in the majority of the manuscripts, if he's the earliest source for that reading, it seems to me that on that basis alone, we ought to be very dubious about accepting his variant. And, and Bergon was very quick to point out, he was perhaps one of the earliest ones to say, that those people who want to put in the prologue of John a phrase, the only begotten God in the bosom of the Father, they're returning to Gnosticism and to a reading from Valentinus because his is the earliest source for that reading. Well, no one listened to him. Uh, Hills came along and repeated what Burgon said and gave more evidence showing that it was a Gnostic reading. No one listened to him. It continued to appear. It was in the New American Standard. It was in the NIV. It, it was in the New English Bible. It was in the Revised Standard Version. I wrote, finally, an entire essay on that textual variant, pointing out that Valentinos was, in fact, the author of it. And I delivered my essay before the New Testament text criticism section of the Society of Biblical Literature. And uh, even Bart Ehrman, in his book, The Orthodox Corruption of Scripture, admits that that is a heretical alteration of the text. He just happens to think it came from a different source other than Valentinos. But he says it's a, an erroneous reading, but still it's in the, our conservative Bibles. So uh, what has changed is not the evidence. What has changed is our lack of appreciation of who the good guys are and the bad guys. It's all become rather blurred, I'm afraid, and that's where the problem is.